Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you for yet another author interview. Hope your day is going well. Hope your week is going well. It's been really foggy and gloomy where I am right now, and I can't complain because we get a lot of sun where I live in Northern California, Um, so maybe that's why the gloom feels somewhat gloomier when it happens. I I don't know, but it's been very foggy and a little dreary, which actually is a kind of good situation for books, right? Stay inside, look at the gloom from inside, have a nice fire and a cup of your favorite warm beverage and read, right? Should It, it should work out for everyone. Well, instead of um, reading, I'm, I'm going to talk about book, a, a book today, and I'm excited to have Mark Sullivan on the podcast today. One, because we are going to talk about his historical fiction, his World War II historical fiction novel, The Last Green Valley. But two, because he is from Montana. He lives in Bozeman, which is oh, about four hours away from my hometown. I was actually in Bozeman over the summer, and um, it's a beautiful area. I I was laughing because, not laughing, but sort of a nerd moment I looked uh I looked up to see when the cat grizz game is thinking it would be kind of funny if it was the week it was the day that we interviewed we our interview was this past Saturday and I thought oh that'd be funny if the cat grizz game was this weekend because Mark lives in Bozeman I went to school in Missoula they're rival schools so uh University of Montana is in Missoula University of Montana is the Grizzlies that's where I went to school uh you uh excuse me MSU, Montana State University, Bobcats, that's in Bozeman, and so the Cat Grizz game is this big rivalry every year, and it's actually this coming Saturday, so it hasn't happened yet. Um, I just thought it would be a fun coincidence if it happened to be the day that we interviewed. I have no idea where Mark went to college. I have no idea. I mean, he lives in Bozeman, so he, in theory, could support the Bobcats. I went to U of M, so in theory, I should support the Grizz. Mainly, I don't care about football all that much. <laughs> uh, when I was going to school there, the Grizz were on a kind of a winning streak. I don't know how many years in a row they'd won that rival game, but I, the, the Bobcats won either shortly after I left college or maybe one of the years I was there and I was like good for them and everyone was mad at me (laughs) so don't talk to me about rival football games that was such a digression it was really just to say I was hoping it would be the same day that Mark and I spoke it was not it's still coming up moving on Mark Sullivan is joining me today to talk about his World War II historical fiction novel, The Last Green Valley. Did I mention that already? I think I did. Let's go ahead and um, I'll give you the description from the back. On the run from one enemy at the mercy of another. In late March 1944, as Stalin's forces push into Ukraine, young Emil and Adeline Martel must make a terrible decision. Do they wait for the Soviet bear's intrusion and risk being sent to Siberia? Or do they reluctantly follow the wolves, murderous Nazi officers who have pledged to protect pure-blood Germans? The Martels are one of many families of German heritage whose ancestors have farmed in Ukraine for more than a century. But after already living under Stalin's horrifying regime, Emil and Adeline decide they must run in, in retreat from their land with the wolves they despise to escape the Soviets and go in search of freedom. Caught between two warring forces and overcoming horrific trials to pursue their hope of immigrating to the West, the Martel's story is a brutal, complex, and ultimately triumphant tale that illuminates the extraordinary power of love, faith, and one family's 
incredible will to survive and see their dreams realized. So that is the description of um, The Last Green Valley. It is based on a family that still lives in Bozeman, the Martell family. And uh, so it's, it's historical fiction, but it is based on the, the stories and the memories and the experiences of the Martell family. Mark will talk a little bit more about that, of course, in the interview and how he this is the second family he's met in Bozeman who had an incredible story stemming from World War II. Of course, for me, this just gives it um, one more connection. As you know, uh, if, if you're a longtime listener, I do love World War II historical fiction. And um, of course, I love Montana, so it works out pretty well that Mark was on the podcast. But let's go ahead and turn now to the interview so that Mark can tell you a little bit more about this novel. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here, and I'm excited to talk about your new novel. It's called The Last Green Valley. Before we do that, though, if you would please share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm Mark Sullivan. Uh, Once upon a time, I was an investigative journalist, and about uh, 29 years ago, I quit my job to chase my dream of being a novelist. Um, I've written 17 or 18 on my own and four or five with James Patterson. Um, the last two have been historical novels, which was a big departure for me. The early ones were all suspense novels, um, but I really love doing historical novels. Uh, I seem to have found my voice and my niche. Okay, and um, can you give an overview of The Last Green Valley? Sure. The Last Green Valley tells the story of the Martell family, mom, dad, two young kids, and they are faced with a terrible decision right at the beginning of the novel. Do they stay in Ukraine and wait for the return of the Soviets who have persecuted them, killed members of their family, sent others to uh, concentration camps uh, in Siberia? Or do they run with the Nazis who have they have come to despise during the German occupation of Ukraine during World War II? And they decide to run with the Nazis. And what happens, they're, they're in a uh, covered wagon, Conestoga wagon, two horses, the last of their belongings in the back. And they take off and they get caught between two armies, the Soviets and the Germans retreating, along with about 130,000 other ethnic Germans who had lived in Ukraine and whose ancestors had lived in Ukraine for more than a century. Um, I'd never heard anything about the story before I heard it uh, the first time, and I got utterly fascinated with it, and it took me into places about the war that I'd never heard of before. That was my inspiration. Yeah, and um, can you talk a little bit more about hearing that story? You talk about it in the preface, sure. but can you yeah. talk about that? I can. So um, after I published Beneath a Scarlet Sky, which was my first historical novel uh, about a true untold story of World War II, people were telling me, oh, you'll never find another one like that. And I was like, no, I, I, I actually think I will. And sure enough, out of the woodwork come all these proposals and letters about various people that had never been written about, relatives, what have you, in war, World War II and, and at other times. And I realized I was going to need some kind of filter for it to work. And the filter became what I went back and considered beneath. Why did that touch so many people around the world? And I came to the conclusion that the story was inherently moving, inspiring, healing to some people and transformative to others. And so those were the four words I used as my filter. And I, you know, I heard a lot of stories that came close, but they weren't you know, making me say, all right, I'm willing to spend two to four years on this book. And then I'm doing a uh, talk at the Noontime Rotary in Bozeman, Montana, and a retired dentist comes up to me afterwards and he says, have you ever heard the story of the Martell family? And I said, you mean the Martells in town, the construction people? And he said, yeah. And I said, no. And he said, well, you really need to hear it the entire time I was reading beneath. It's all I could think of. So a couple of days later, I pull into this neighborhood near my house 
and I got this weird feeling and I don't get it until I get out in Bill Martell's driveway and I can't be, uh, um, I can't be, oh, I don't know, 250 yards from where I heard Pino Lella's story and Beneath the Scarlet Sky. So I'm primed when I go in the door and 10 minutes into the bill telling the story, I'm sitting forward in my seat and an hour into it, I know I'm telling it because the story of Emile and Adeline Martel is one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. I was amazed by what you wrote in the preface uh, about that because you found it in Bozeman, which is not that big of a town <laughs> um, and, you know, not that far from where you found the inspiration for your first story. So that is that's really amazing. Um well, my agent told me to go knock on every door in that neighborhood and say you have a career there. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to have to start talking to everybody. I want to jump in here to take the first break of the podcast, but I mentioned Bozeman being a fairly small town in the grand scheme of things. It's large enough by Montana standards, but I, I just want to put out there, for those of you who may be wondering, Mark and I have never met, uh, nor do I know the Martell family. I, I don't know anyone in that family. So, yes, Montana only has a million-ish people. There's a little more than a million people. Um, it's a very large state, fourth largest state in the, in the country. So we don't actually all know each other. <laughs> Even though I say that, it's amazing how quickly you'll find connections with other Montanans. But no, all Montanans do not know each other despite the smallness of the state and everyone in Bozeman doesn't know each other either. So there are still people um, in the town who could have great stories th with whom Mark has not spoken yet. That was really just meant to be silly and not serious, but I have been asked a lot if I know XYZ in Montana and we do not all know each other, especially in a state as large as it is. Let's go ahead and take that first break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mark Sullivan about his historical fiction novel, The Last Green Valley. Can you can you talk a little bit more about Emil and Adeline and um, their story, but also what about them you think will resonate with readers? Okay, so Emil Martel uh, grows up like Adeline does in a German colony in Ukraine. And he leads a fairly restricted life. It's pretty good until the takeover of communism. And then they're thrown off their land. He's starved. Adeline, same thing happens to her family. Her father gets sent to the gulag and is never seen again. His father comes back from the gulag, a broken man. And by the time we see them, they have learned that under con communism and any totalitarian society, the best thing you could do is keep your head down, have no inspiration whatsoever, never aspire to anything more than what you've got. And that lasts all the way until this pivotal moment that I talk about. They have learned to stay hidden, right in plain sight. But then they take off with the Germans and that begins to unravel and people begin to see them for who they are and they begin to see themselves for who they are. And they go through just such incredible trials on this journey from Ukraine all the way to Poland and afterwards across Germany and then back to a prison camp. Um, I had never heard a story of people overcoming so much hardship and then finally triumphing. And I just was so blown away by that story. It made my own 
issues in life seem small. And I've had so many readers write to me and say, you know, I reading this book, I couldn't help but think back on all the times that I bemoaned my plight or what I was doing and or didn't trust someone I loved. And reading this book made me want to be a better person. And, you know, hearing the story made me want to be a better person. Their story really is amazing, and it must have been really incredible to to not only hear that story, but then start researching the events of the story. Mm-hmm. How do you go about um, fictionalizing? Because this is a historical fiction. So how do you go about mm-hmm. um, kind of filling in all of those spaces from the story that was told? Well, one of the things I like to do is if I can, I go there. And I did. I, I retraced their entire route. Uh, in three separate trips. Um, The most moving of those trips was to Ukraine. I went with Bill and Walter, uh, who are still alive, and uh, we went up this horrendous road, about eight hours bouncing, and uh, we finally got to this small town of Tyrady, which used to be known as um, Friedensal. And we were actually able to find through a 1940 or 41 plat plan, the land and the, the the ruins of the house where the boys grew up. We found the well, we found the root cellar that Emil had built. And for the to see the boys, you know, these are one man was 81 and one was 79. And you could just see them looking at this ruin and basically confronting the entire improbable arc of their life from abject poverty under communism and then Nazism, and then all the way to the United States, and at a time they become extraordinarily successful. So it was very emotional, but not as emotional as the following day or two days later when we had to charter a plane to get there because the road was even worse. And we went to a place called Poltava, which is where Mr. Martel was imprisoned in a prisoner of war camp after the war. And he went in there with 2,000 people, uh, and they were all crammed 500, 500, 500, 500. And Emil was in the basement of a bombed out museum. We found that museum. We found the director, and he took us on a private tour once he learned that Emil had been held captive there and that he had provided wood for one of the cooks because the director's mother was one of the cooks. I mean, you can't make this up. Wow. But we found him and he told us this story and we were actually able to go into the basement where Emil was held and to see these men contemplate the reality of what their father endured was just one of the most emotionally charged things I've ever experienced. Um, that gave me a lot of understanding of Emil's plight and Adeline's plight. And then I just tried to learn as much about the era as I could, looking for those telling moments, those telling uh, details in the story that makes that, you know, the, the wall of reality break and the readers transported to this time and place. Um, I ended up going all the way across <clears throat> from Moldova, across Romania, Hungary, up to Poland, and then was able to uh, actually walk the final escape route that Adeline and the boys took near the end of the book. And that again was just amazing to understand just how courageous she had to have been to have done it. Um, And that fully informed me when I sat down to write. Yeah, I can only imagine, um, I mean, not only going there yourself, but then to be there with with the, the sons that are depicted in this story, because they're they're pretty young in the story. So I'm, I imagine that they remember some things, but mm-hmm. not a lot. And so to be there had to have been really moving. Yeah, very much so. And And the more time we spent in Eastern Europe, the more they remembered, which mm-hmm. was great. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they and, and I was lucky that I had recordings of Emil and Adeline talking about the, the escape. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. What other types of research did you then do to fill in those gaps? Uh, I read a lot about Ukraine under German occupation, and I read as much as I could find about 
the long trek where uh, you know all these 128, 129,000 ethnic Germans take off in wagons across heading for Germany. And they really don't know why they're being protected, right, until very late in the book. And that was some of the research that I ended up incorporating into the story. Like, why were the Germans protecting them? What was the real impetus? And when I found out, I was shocked. I don't want to give it away, but um, it is pretty shocking to, to discover that. And I learned a lot of other things, like Lodz Poland was effectively the Ellis Island of Nazi Germany. I had no idea. And we went there, and sure enough, it was, and I was able to do a bunch of research about it. Um, and I And I try to read books that give me a thorough grounding of, you know, history books tend to focus on what happened and what got recorded, not necessarily what happened, but what got recorded. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking between the lines. So if there's something recorded, I go, well, what does that mean? What does that say about, you know, the society or what have you? And then I go from there. It is time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, Mark will be talking a bit about character development and how it is similar and also different from character development in a fully fictional novel. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Mark Sullivan. We are talking about his World War II historical fiction novel, The Last Green Valley. Writing historical fiction is a, a little different, of course, than writing fiction. So in terms of your characters, how much harder is it, do you feel, or maybe not harder, but just talk about character development, how you write characters based on people that actually exist. And um, can you just walk through that process a little bit? Sure. Um, well, the first thing is I try to get to know him as well as I can. And again, I had these recordings of Emil and Adeline. So I got a sense of their, you know, their demeanor, their sense of humor, uh, which was very prevalent, um, remarkably. Um, but they would talk also, frankly, about what happened to them. And I, I found that by listening, I was able to kind of get into the cadence of the way they thought, not necessarily spoke, but thought. And, um, you know, they talked about what happened before the trek and what happened after. And that gave me a thorough, pretty thorough grounding in who they were. The big mystery of this was Emil Martel, after the war, gets captured and gets sent to this prison camp in far eastern Ukraine in Poltava. And by all accounts, he goes in there, the same man he pretty much was since he was 15 or 16, when he got thrown off the land, he starved. He's someone who keeps his head down. He takes no initiative, etc. And something happens to him in that prison camp. And I, I sorry, Bill and Walter both agreed, yes, something radically happened to him in the prison camp. He never talked about it much. But it was Bill's speculation that there must have been one or two other men that he trusted who were allies and that they must have changed the way he thinking, because quite literally. Uh, you've read the book when he escapes, he's a different person. He's he's not James Bond or anything, but he seems 
He sees opportunity and he takes risks and he sees opportunity and he takes massive risks. Mm -hmm. And it, he does this again and again and again and again throughout his entire the rest of his entire life. And he becomes this insanely successful person. Um, so Bill said, I don't know what happened in the prison camp. And he didn't talk about it very much. So you're going to have to figure it out. And that's where the fictional aspects of the story happen. Um, what is the spiritual transformation of Emile Martel? Adeline has her own journey, um, but Emile, that kind of inner transformation was a mystery to me, and I had to come up with something that would explain it. So I did. And um, what is the family's reaction to the book, Ben? Oh, they love it. They, Beautiful. Yeah, they, they, they love it. They were always in awe of their parents and grandparents. Uh, but now that it's down on paper, you know, Bill's read the book about four times. And he says, every time I read it, I just can't believe what courage my parents had mm -hmm. that they would have done this and that there were all sorts of people with the same kind of courage. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, really the story right from the beginning to me was less the story of, you know, that we usually read about war, spies or soldiers or what have you. These were people who were just trying to get out of the way. And mm -hmm. when I learned when I learned how many millions of people were displaced by World War II, I said, OK, the Martell story can be emblematic of that. And that got me even more interested. Well, and there are so many amazing events and people that you could write about in World War II. But just the, the, the fact that they're they're running from Stalin, but they're they're hoping to be protected by the Nazis. I mean, just the just even the initial premise of the book, when you start reading it, they're stuck between these two powers that, uh, you know, those of us from our perspective of history would not trust either one, <laughs> and, but they have to throw nope. a lot in with one of them. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yes. it's just amazing. And then from my perspective, the fact that they end up in Montana, because that's where I grew up, is just another... Um, really cool element of the book it you know in the grand scheme of things it's it's not that important but for me it's like awesome they ended up in a really good place <laughs> so um God. what do you you said that you know you have been writing um thrillers and then you've just started writing these two historical um fiction novels what about historical fiction it draws you to writing in that genre uh, well, first, there's, you know, with these stories, I had a spine of a story to begin with, you know, and it was compelling. Both of them were, as I said earlier, they were inherently moving, inspiring, healing and transformative to other people. And I think the stakes in historical fiction are clearer to the author, right? You understand the forces at play because it's hindsight. And I like the process of bringing a t an era to life. Um, I didn't know I'd be good at it, but I think I'm pretty good at it. And drawing you in with, again, telling detail as well as trying to be compassionate and understand the characters and their plight. And the inherent power of that, the dynamics of it are very, very attractive to any dramatic writer. And I am. So then what are you working on now? Are you, are you going to continue in this genre? Are you going to work in another genre for a while? Are, are you working on something now? Yeah, I'm, you know, again, you know, after I wrote um, Last Green Valley, people said, you'll never find another story like that. And I said, I think I will. And sure enough, this guy was a former commander of SEAL Team 6 who knows my son comes to me and tells me this story that he heard in Uganda about two 14-year-old children, boy and girl, who get kidnapped in uh, 1994 by this messianic warlord in, named Joseph Kony. And he turns them in, along with 25,000 other children that he kidnaps, he turns them into some of the fiercest combatants on earth. And about halfway through this 10-year period, Florence and Anthony meet and they fall in love. I mean, really fall in love. 
And the power of love enables them to endure one of the most insane experiences I've ever heard. And yet they come out these totally whole people who immediately, once they've gotten out of the situation after 10 years, they turn around and they start helping other of the children to escape and to get out. And again, it's one of these stories like, it's like, oh my God, this happened to people. Uh, I went to Uganda and spent three weeks with Anthony and Florence in June. Um, I was supposed to be there last year. Uh, I'm going to write it as a historical novel because I want the reader to sit right on their shoulders to understand clearly what they went through. Do you have a working title or anything? It's called Silver Stars in the Sky. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, sure. Are there any other of your other writings that you would like to highlight? I'm sure Beneath the Scarlet Sky is, is another great story of World War II. It's about a 17-year-old boy who leads Jews escaping Nazi-occupied Italy over the top of the Alps into Switzerland in the winter of 1943-44. And then through a series of remarkable circumstances in the summer of 44, this kid Pinolella becomes a spy inside the German high command. And again, it's one of these stories that you're just blown away when you hear it for the first time. Um, yeah, that, I mean, I'm, I'm wanting to go back and, and read that one as well when I, when I hopefully have time. Sure. Time for the third and final break of the podcast. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Mark Sullivan. You um, started as a journalist, so you've been writing for a long time, but what finally made you uh, make that transition into writing for publication? Uh, well, um, my initial impetus to write uh, was I was seven years old in parochial school and I got in a fist fight in the hallway and this six foot, 200 pound nun picked me up by the scruff of my neck. And she was the vice principal and disciplinarian. And she was also my mother's best friend. So I figured I was up a creek without a paddle. And uh, this was at a time when there was corporal punishment and I figured I was gonna get my fanny smacked. Um, but she said, your punishment is you're going to go home and you're going to write a short story and enter the grades one through eight short story writing contest. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, but I, I was glad I wasn't getting spanked. So I went home. Uh, my mother was oblivious. I told I was the kind of kid who was immediately going to go outside. Instead, I ran upstairs, told her I had to write something for school, sat there, had no idea what to write. 40 minutes goes by, I'm panicking, and all of a sudden this cottontail rabbit goes burning through our backyard and disappears into the cornfield across the street with a beagle hot on its tail. And so I went, okay. And so I wrote this story about this rabbit getting chased all over the farm that was right next to us and uh, turned it in. Two weeks later, my parents get a call from the vice principal and the principal to come in and my parents were like, what's going on? And they slide it across and they say, who wrote it? And we've never seen it before. What is this? And they said, well, it's the short story your son wrote to win the grades one through eight contest. And I had to read the story in front of the school and everybody cheered and I was like, okay, <laughs> I guess this is what I'm doing. That's how it started. <laughs> That's awesome. And now I feel like um, 
that needs to be some sort of a story uh, that yeah, yeah. I know you don't, you, yeah. you don't write children's books, but that sounds like a very sort of Roald Dahl-esque kind of children's book and that, that sure. nun definitely needs her, her own story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's wonderful. From your own experience, then, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, I'll say what I always say when people coming up to me and ask me, and I just say, look, um, the difference between people who write is people who finish. So you got once you sit down, you got to commit to finishing whatever you're doing. Not that day, but in the long run, it has to be firm in your mind. The next thing is learn the mechanics of writing. You know, there are, there are rules. Learn them. Uh, read the elements of style by Strunk. It's thin, it's easy to understand, it'll put you a long way forward towards doing it. The next thing is write the same time, same place every day if you can, even if it's only an hour, even if it's a half hour, but do it. Writing is like working out. If you're not doing it on a daily basis, it hurts when you do it. If you do it on a daily basis, it just becomes part of your routine. Um, don't expect this thing to happen fast. I cringe when I hear people say, I work on it for six weeks. I'm like, okay, try a couple of years. Um, and I got to admit, there's only been two people who have taken my total advice on this. Uh, and both of them are published authors, including my son, Connor. Okay, thank you for that. Um, what, what genre does Connor write in? Connor writes thrillers. He's very good. He wrote a book called um, Sleeping Bear. It was out from um, Atria and uh, Emily Bessler books. Uh, great book. Cool. When you take the time to read for yourself, uh, as opposed to reading for research or something else, what genres and authors are you drawn to? Um, I read all over the map, mostly because I write all over the map. But I mean, I just read a book called Fossil Men by Kermit Patterson, which is about the hunt for the oldest living or oldest human ancestor. And that got me fascinated. Uh, I, I never read anything like it. It was all about archeology span and um, it was very well done. Um, some of my favorite authors are Kristen Hanna. I think she's brilliant. Um, I read everything she writes. Uh, the late uh, Jim Harrison, who was a poet who also wrote these incredible stories uh, is another one of my favorites. Um, Michael Conley is never bad. He's always on it. He's great. Uh, Greg Hurwitz uh, is, is not only a friend, uh, somebody I admire very much as a writer. Yeah, that does it. Okay. And I love that uh, Kristen Hanna actually has a, a blurb on the a, a front, a quote on the front of The Last Green Valley that I thought when I, uh, when I, oh, when I saw the book, I thought, wow, that's really cool because I also love Kristen yeah. Hanna. Yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty pumped when she loved the book. I bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you have a website. Um, so if you can tell people where to find the website as well as um, any social media that you're active on. Sure. Uh, the website is uh, MarkSullivanBooks.com. I am on Facebook at Mark Sullivan Author and I am on Twitter at, at Mark Sullivan Books. I got to admit, though, I don't spend a lot of time on social media. It's not my thing. Um, but every now and then you'll hear me on there. OK, thank you for that. Is there anything that we have not talked about during this time together that you were hoping to highlight? Well, you know, again, I write books. The books I'm really interested in writing these days are based on stories that are inherently moving, inspiring, healing, and transformative. I get excited when I write these books, and I find that people are um, very much open to buy them. Uh, I get a lot of letters about these books, probably 150 times all my other books combined. Uh, people just want me to know how the story moved them and what happened to them afterwards. Um, that is about as good as it gets uh, being a writer to get that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would imagine um, because I mean it is such that it is such a compelling story, and I imagine um, that beneath the scarlet sky, uh, a scarlet sky is also as compelling. So it's wonderful to hear from readers who are moved by 
not only what you wrote, but by the stories of real people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fantastic. Well, Mark, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about The Last Green Valley and writing. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you once again to Mark for talking to me about The Last Green Valley, uh, a little bit about Beneath a Scarlet Sky, about writing in general. I really appreciate it. Before we started recording, we were having, you know, a little bit of small talk before the interview began, and I mentioned that I am from a town called Plains and said where it was, and he said, oh yeah, I'm going to be driving right by there. Um, I think it was the same day, and I said, oh, where are you going? And he said, the Yak. And that was another another thing that made me smile because how often do you hear that phrase? Oh yeah, I'm going to the yak. <laughs> no, it's not an animal. It's a it's a place. It's a very beautiful place in northwestern Montana, very northwestern Montana, kind of near where my mom grew up. And um, I just never really think about stuff like that. I, I know that there are place names everywhere that would sound kind of strange to people who are from elsewhere but uh i just thought the yak was kind of one of those because you would normally when you're talking about the yak you're talking about an animal or it might be a good bar name right um but uh, uh in terms of a beautiful place in nature probably not your first thought um anyway i hope that trip went well and as he drove past planes he said hello in the general direction <laughs> of planes <laughs> i don't know at any rate Thank you, Mark, for joining me, and thank you, my listeners, for joining me, as always. I greatly appreciate your support. In terms of support, if you have not done so already, please do follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Also, if you have not left a review, I would greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to write a review, leave a starred review, whatever you're inspired to do, but it really does help us to get this podcast out to more people who love to read and maybe who are looking for authors that they have not read yet. So please do follow us on social media and um, write a review if you have not done so already. And of course, follow Mark on his social media platforms. And if you have read the book, write a review. Always helpful for everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you will join me for the next episode where I will be talking about Thanksgiving. It is that time of year and I have been reading and listening to some Thanksgiving books to share with you. So join me for that episode on Friday. In the meantime, hope you're having a wonderful week. And whether it's foggy, sunny, snowy, rainy, windy, what have you, I hope that your week is affording you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.